Hello everybody, we will talk about the human skeleton. Human skeleton consists of two parts, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. First, we will talk about the axial skeleton. <coughs> the axial skeleton consists of 80 bones and these bones include the bones of the skull, the bones of the vertebral column, and the bones of the thoracic cage. So, the skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage together form the axial skeleton, and there are total 80 bones in this part of the skeleton. <coughs> Here, you see, by two different colors, the axial and appendicular parts have been shown. So the bones of the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage belong to the axial skeleton. And the appendicular skeleton includes the upper, two upper and two lower extremities. Okay. So first we'll talk about the axial skeleton. Let's talk about the skull. <coughs> the skull consists of two sets of bones. Cranial bones, total 8. Cranial bones and facial bones, total 14. Cranial bones form the cranial cavity in which the most important organ of the body, which is the brain, located. Okay. So, the cranial bones form the cranial cavity for the brain and also the cranial bones protect the brain. Some head and neck muscles get attached to the cranial bones. So, those are the functions of the cranial bones and then facial bones form the framework of the face. And also, facial bones form the cavities like oral cavity, nasal cavity, orbital fossa for the sensory organs, organs for your eyeballs, for your tongue, for your nose, <coughs> and the openings for the air and food passages, those openings are also formed by the facial bones like nasal cavity oral cavity and also your teeth are attached to the facial bones lower teeth are attached to the mandible lower jaw bone and upper teeth are attached to the maxilla the upper jaw and also the facial muscles are attached to the facial bones and facial muscles perform important functions. One is facial expression, speech and chewing the food. So uh, those are also helped by the facial muscles. Some facial muscles help in mastication or chewing the food. Some facial muscles help to uh, speech production, move the mandible and tongue. So, those are the important functions of the facial bones. House the sensory organs for sight, taste, smell. Uh, form openings, for example, the nasal cavity, oral cavity and attachment of the teeth and facial expression, speech and mastication. So, the cranial bones are attached to each other by the joints and those joints are called the sutures. So sutures are the joints between the cranial bones. <coughs> and let's see the cranial bones. Eight cranial bones include one frontal bone, two parietal bones, one occipital bone, two temporal bones, one sphenoid and one 
ethmoid. So total eight bones. This you can easily see from outside if you see the skull and these two most part of these two bones are not uh, visible from outside. This one sphenoid forms the floor of the skull, middle portion of the floor of the skull and ethmoid uh, bone mainly forms the roof of the nasal cavity. So, uh, if you see the skull from the front, this is the front or anterior view of the skull. You can see this is the frontal bone. It forms the forehead as well as upper boundary of the orbital fossa here and a roof of the orbital fossa and this area between two supraorbital margins these are called supraorbital margins is called the glabella so that is the frontal bone now behind the frontal bone or posterior to the frontal bone you have two parietal bones it's red colored and frontal bone is attached to the parietal bones by this suture here that is called the coronal suture okay then below the parietal bone you have the temporal bone so this is the temporal bone this is another temporal bone and the temporal and parietal are attached to each other by this suture this is called the squamous suture here okay so those are the cranial bones you can easily see from outside now the sphenoid if you look through the orbital fossa you can see a small part of sphenoid so the red colored here through the orbital fossa you can see the sphenoid okay part of the sphenoid and part of ethmoid you can see if you look through the nasal cavity so this is called the perpendicular plate of ethmoid uh, you can see a part of the ethmoid okay and <coughs> Those are the cranial bones. Now let's see the facial bones. Uh, which facial bones you can see uh, from the front? These are two nasal bones from the bridge of the nose here, the blue colored. Okay, and then this green color bone here, that is small one, is a lacrimal bone. So you have two nasal, two lacrimal. Lacrimal bone. Uh, has a fossa in which the lacrimal gland is located that contains the tear <clears throat> then uh, you see this is the cheekbone these two are zygomatic and they form the cheek the prominence of the cheek and then these are maxillary bones Two maxillary bones fuse here at the mid midline to form one maxilla so this whole thing is the maxilla and this is one maxillary bone this is another maxillary bone and they join here so two maxillary bones fuse together to form the maxilla the upper jaw and then this is the lower jaw formed by the mandible so this bone is the mandible this is the only movable bone of your skull okay so those are some facial bones then if you look through the nasal cavity the lower part of the nasal septum is formed by this bone that is called the vomer and also you will see inside the nose or nasal cavity you have nasal concha okay so nasal concha belong to the facial bones uh, 
So let's quickly review first. Uh, from the front view or entry view, you can see the frontal bone, two parietal bones you can see here, then two temporal bones, right? And you can see the part of ethmoid, uh, uh, sphenoid, and part of ethmoid. Another bone, which is the occipital bone, located in the back. That's why you don't see in this view. Now, which facial bones you can see here? Two nasal bones from the bridge of the nose, two lacrimal bones, then you see two zygomatic bones, two maxillary bones, you see the mandible, you see the vomer, and concha, nasal concha. The main sutures of the skull are coronal suture that I showed you that joins the frontal bone with two parietal bones, so between parietal and frontal. Sagittal suture, two parietal bones joined together by the sagittal suture, which is the midline of the skull. Then, lambdoid suture is in the back. Parietal bones articulate with the occipital bone by this suture called the lambdoid suture. So, it is in the back between occipital and two parietals. And then, squamous suture between parietal and temporal. So, those are the main or major sutures. Here, this is a side view or lateral view of the skull. So, you can see again the frontal bone, one parietal, another is in the other side, one temporal, the other one is on the opposite side, and this is the occipital bone. Okay. <clears throat> and here, which facial bones you can see? You can see um, the nasal bones lacrimal, you can see the zygomatic cheekbone, maxillary bone, mandible. Okay, those are the bones you can see from the side. This is the posterior view of the skull. So, here you can see the sagittal suture connects two parietal bones, right and left, right. And this is the lambdoid suture that connects the occipital and two parietals. So, this is the lambdoid suture here. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, if you see the occipital bone, in the back of the occipital bone, there is a small elevated structure and that is called the external occipital protuberance. You can feel it with your um, finger. If you touch the back of your skull, you can see little elevated structure, bony structure. And from the external occipital protuberance, a crest, prominent uh, bony, elongated bony structure goes down. That is called the external occipital crest. So, two things. One is protuberance. That's the kind of round structure here. And crest is kind of sharp, elongated structure. Both are called external occipital because outside of the occipital bone, outer surface of the occipital bone. And then you have two pairs of nuchal lines, superior nuchal lines and inferior nuchal lines. You can see these are for the attachment of the posterior neck muscles. Okay, and then if you see a temporal bone, this is a temporal bone. You see the upper part of the temporal bone is a flat bone. However, in the lower part, you have a couple of structures. This sharp pointed process is called the styloid process. And this one is kind of bland, round. This is called the mastoid process. Okay, and if you have uh, 
ear infection then this mustard process uh, has you know uh, small spaces where the pus or infected fluid can accumulate and you will feel pain there if you press the mustard process uh, behind the posterior to the ear so you can feel it the bumpy area there and then you have this external acoustic meatus the canal outer ear canal and this is another process that is going to the zygomatic bone that's why this is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone so temporal bone has three processes here this sharp one is the steloid this blunt one is mastoid and this one is the zygomatic process and this is the external acoustic meatus and now if you see the mandible this is the mandible this is the body of the mandible and this part arm like structure is called the ramus so ramus is this part and body is this part okay and the lower teeth are attached to the upper surface of the mandible and this area of the mandible is called the alveolar margin similarly uh, in the maxillary bone you see you have the upper teeth attached here and that area is called the alveolar margin of the maxilla so both maxilla and mandible have the alveolar margin where the teeth are attached okay now this is the bottom of the skull if you look uh, from uh, the bottom this is the bottom of the skull and you see uh, one thing you notice here there are several openings or foramen this is the largest one in the occipital bone and this is called foramen magnum from the brain the spinal cord gets out through this foramen magnum and this structure in the occipital bone that is called the occipital condyle that one this structure you have to in the occipital bone articulate with the first cervical vertebrae because your whole skull is sitting on the uppermost vertebrae that is the cervical one okay so that is the occipital those are the occipital condyles why you have several foramen in the bottom of the skull you know that many blood vessels go to the brain arteries enter into the brain veins come out from the brain so some of those foramens are for the blood vessels and some of those are for the cranial nerves that uh, in the floor of the skull you can see the occipital bone in the posterior part and this red one is the sphenoid bone i mentioned before the middle portion of the floor is mainly formed by the sphenoid bone it looks like a bat or butterfly okay then uh, you can see the pet, uh, palate this this is the roof of the oral cavity if you put your finger inside your mouth and move up you will touch the hard palate so hard palate is formed by the this part is the max part of maxillary bone and this is the palatine bone so palatine in the back and maxilla in the front from the hard palate <coughs> so uh, that's how the bottom of the skull looks like in infants if you see the growing cranial bones these are growing are developing cranial bones they are not yet uh, you know completely formed you see between the cranial bones you have membranes and these membranous soft areas are called frontanels so frontanels are the membranous areas between the developing cranial bones and this when the cranial bones are uh, uh, developed completely or formation of the cranial bones are completed then uh, everything become hard uh, 
and the bones are attached by the sutures. However, in infants, these areas are still soft, the front tunnels, and that is very helpful. Uh, how the front tunnels help? Number one, because of the front tunnels, you know, childbirth becomes easy when the you know head of uh, the fetus gets out because of the soft areas or membranes between the cranial bones the bones can come close to each other and the size of the head can get smaller so the skull can squeeze sometimes the, the growing bones can you know overlap each other that is one advantage so through the birth canal the fetus can easily head can easily come out uh, number two you know that in infants the brain grows pretty fast so uh, it allows the brain to grow if the joints are already fixed then the brain won't be able to grow right so the brain can easily grow or can easily get bigger so front tunnels help in different ways sometimes you know uh, inside the brain fluid accumulates that's a clinical condition that is called hydro hydro means water cephalus means cephalic part is the head so hydrocephalus is a clinical condition in which the fluid accumulates inside the brain and the brain uh, becomes big and since the small baby or infants have uh, front tunnels uh, the skull will get bigger when the brain uh, pressure inside the brain increases the size of the brain gets bigger the skull can expand because of the soft areas between the cranial bones and that you can see from outside the head of the infant or baby uh, is big than normal that is called hydrocephalus okay in adults if hydrocephalus occurs you won't see the skull is getting bigger because you understand now that uh, the sutures are hard joints fixed so the bones cannot move so that will increase the intracranial pressure a lot as i showed you the temporal bone before the upper part is flat and in the lower part you have sharp process styloid and blunt process that is the mastoid where the infected fluid or pus can accumulate in ear infection then this is going to the zygomatic bone zygomatic process external acoustic meatus okay so this is a temporal bone <coughs> this is a sphenoid butterfly or uh, flying bat shaped bone so it has a body that is called the body of the sphenoid in the middle and the upper surface of the body you have a fossa basin like depression and that is called hypophyseal fossa why hypophysis or pituitary gland is located in that fossa okay so pituitary gland is also called hypophysis that's why this depression here is called the or fossa is called the hypophyseal fossa okay and this bone has two pairs of wings these two are called the lesser wings because they are smaller and these two are called the greater wings okay under the lesser wing you have a canal under each lesser wing you have a canal so you have two canals for the optic nerves so from the eye optic nerves enter into the brain through these canals under the lesser wings and those are optic canals for the optic nerves okay and then uh, here you can see in the back of the greater wing oval shaped foramen called the foramen oval So those are few structures uh, of the spinoid bone. It has a body. On the body, you have a fossa that is called the hypophyseal fossa for the pituitary. And this bone has two lesser wings, two greater wings, 
and under the lesser wings you have the optic canals and in the greater wings you have uh, oval shaped foramen foramen oval also you have tiny foramen here foramen is spinosum okay this is an ethmoid bone and most part of it uh, is difficult uh, you cannot see from our outside it is in the roof of the nasal cavity so if you see the spinoid bone it has a middle portion like this and two lateral masses like this so these two are lateral masses and this is a bony plate so in the lateral masses you'll see many air cells or sinuses contain air so air sinuses or air cells okay called ethmoidal air cells and now let's see the so these two are lateral masses now let's see the middle portion <coughs> the lower part of the middle portion forms the upper part of the nasal septum so it enters into the nasal cavity and you know that inside the nasal cavity you have a partition or septum and the upper part of the bony nasal septum bony part of the nasal septum is formed by this part of the ethmoid bone that is called the perpendicular plate of ethmoid so this is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid which forms the upper part of nasal septum you know nasal septum has cartilage and bone this perpendicular plate of ethmoid forms the upper part of bony part of the nasal septum okay and then uh, who forms the lower part of the bony part of the nasal septum the vomer plow shaped bone here so this is the vomer and vomer vomer forms the lower part of the nasal septum so this whole structure is the bony or hard part of nasal septum hard or bony part of nasal septum okay and it is formed by two bones the upper part is by the perpendicular plate of ethmoid and lower part by the vomer okay and you see the middle portion also extends slightly upwards like here this part and that is called crista galley and this crista galley uh, you can see uh, if you look inside the skull and now another structure is here that is called the perpendicular uh, that is called the cribriform plate cribriform plate of ethmoid bone and in the cribriform plate you will see many tiny holes these are called olfactory foramina small holes are called foramina larger ones are foramen so these are tiny many olfactory foramina from the nasal cavity olfactory nerve fibers pass through those olfactory foramina that, that's why they are called olfactory foramina for the olfactory nerve fibers and these olfactory nerve fibers carry the smell signal olfaction from the nose to the brain okay so that's uh, the ethmoid 
it has two lateral masses and lateral masses contain the air cells or air sinuses and middle portion uh, the lower part goes into the nasal cavity forms the upper portion of the nasal septum and upper extended part is called the cristagalli and in both sides of the cristagalli you have the cribriform plate and in that plate you have many tiny olfactory foramina for the olfactory nerve fibers okay now uh, sometimes what can happen if this bone gets you know hit by something uh, that will shake the cribriform plate and may crash the olfactory nerve fibers right and that may cause the loss of smell perception and that is called anosmia the person uh, will not smell uh, anything because of the damage of the olfactory nerve fibers or destruction of the olfactory nerve fibers now this is the floor of the skull you are looking inside not the bottom this is the floor okay so <clears throat> this part the yellow part is the frontal bone and this middle part you see the brown color that is the uppermost portion of the ethmoid that i showed you in previous slide here this is the upper part and you have the cristagalli and cribriform plate right so let's see here you see this is the cristagalli this middle portion and in both sides cribriform plate of ethmoid and you see the olfactory foramina make sense so this is the top part of the ethmoid okay and then uh, this is that butterfly or bat shaped bone in the middle of the floor the skull and it is the sphenoid this is the hypophyseal fossa for the pituitary on the body and these are lesser wings these are greater wings you see the optic canals right and you can also see so optic canals here okay this is the hypophyseal fossa for the pituitary these are lesser wings greater wings and in greater wings you see a uh, few foramen oval shaped foramen oval that uh, small one posterior to foramen oval foramen is spinosum and anterior to foramen oval you have foramen rotundum so three in each greater wing you can see here okay now let's see uh, behind the sphenoid you have the part of the temporal bone okay and in the temporal bone here in the inner side of the temporal bone you can see the internal acoustic meatus outer uh, part of the temporal bone you had the external acoustic meatus i showed you before and this is the internal acoustic meatus okay and this is the occipital bone and foramen magnum you see for the spinal cord that descends from the brain stem from the brain okay so that is the floor of the skull now <coughs> uh, in the floor of the skull you have three fossa what are those this is the anterior fossa middle fossa posterior fossa now the bones of the face you have the lower jaw this is the only movable bone of the skull that is the mandible <clears throat> then you have two maxillary bones together from the maxilla two zygomatic or cheekbones two nasal bones from the bridge, uh, bridge of the nose and then two lacrimal bones two palatine bones one plow shaped bone that is the bomber and two nasal concha <clears throat> mandible uh, is the largest and strongest bone of the face and it joins uh, with the temporal bone 
at the temporomandibular joint. So mandible and temporal bone join at the temporomandibular joint or TMJ. This is the joint where the mandible moves. Sometimes uh, there is a clinical condition that is called locked jaw. What can happen? Uh, the person opens the mouth but it gets locked there so cannot close the mouth. So that can happen at TMJ. Okay. So this is the mandible. I already mentioned that uh, body of the mandible uh, and two ramus, arm like parts of the mandible and <coughs> alveolar margin where the teeth are attached, the upper surface of the body is alveolar margin and then in each side of the body you have a mental foramen. So this is one side and the other side you have another one. So you have two mental foramen in the body. Okay. And now see the ramus. The ramus um, has two structures at the upper part of the ramus. This one is called the mandibular condyle. It is kind of round and this is flat. This is the coronoid process. So coronoid process and mandibular condyle. The mandibular condyle joins the temporal bone. In temporal bone, you have the mandibular fossa that means the fossa for the mandible and this condyle of the mandible enters into the fossa and forms the temporal mandibular joint or tmj okay so this part goes into the fossa to form the temporal mandibular joint okay now in the inner surface of the ramus you have a foramen also you have in this one the inner surface if you look uh, at the inner surface that is the mandibular foramen okay so you have two mental foramen in the body and two mandibular foramen uh, in the inner surface of the or inner side of the ramus okay mandible uh, is the only movable bone of the skull and you use the mandible a lot to chew the food for mastication to speak to you know um, uh, crash the food open the mouth close the mouth so you need to move the mandible maxillary bones uh, two maxillary bones join to form the maxilla or upper jaw so this is one maxillary bone and Inside the maxillary bone, uh, there is a large sinus or air filled cavity that is called the maxillary sinus, largest sinus in the bones. And that's why this bone is light because inside is not solid, there is a large maxillary sinus. And sometimes, you know, infection occurs in, in the wall of the sinus, and that is called sinusitis. In that case fluid accumulates inside the sinus you feel you know uh, heavy head heaviness in the head you know you feel like you know clumsy and uh, uh, pain sometimes uh, so if you can drain the fluid out and uh, you know give antibiotics and antihistamine that can take care of the uh, sinusitis sometimes you need to take more invasive procedure to wash or clean the sinus <clears throat> and maxillary bone has two processes this part is going to the frontal bone so that's why this is called the frontal process and this part is going to the zygomatic bone that's why it is called the zygomatic process okay and this is the alveolar margin where the teeth are upper teeth are attached <clears throat> Zygomatic bones form the prominence of the cheek 
and nasal bones form the bridge of the nose lacrimal bones uh, from the medial wall of the orbital fossa and uh, uh, houses the lacrimal sac that contains the tear palate and bones i uh, mentioned already forms the posterior part of the palate its name is palatine right so the if you see the palate hard part of the palate which is actually the roof of the mouth and this is hard palate bony part of the palate if you see the hard palate the anterior two-third that means anterior or front anterior two-third part is formed by the maxilla and posterior one-third part by palatine bone so these two bones together form the heart palate okay anterior two-third by the maxilla upper jaw bone right and posterior one-third by the palatine bone vomer uh, forms the lower part of nasal septum that i mentioned already explained that is a plow shaped bone so here this is the nasal septum so you see the upper part is formed by the perpendicular plate of ethmoid you remember i explained that the lower part is by the vomer so this part is the heart or bony part and this is the cartilaginous part that you can actually move the front of the nasal septum from outside if you just move the nasal septum the partition you can do that because of this cartilage so bony part is formed by these two bones the upper part is by the ethmoid perpendicular plate of ethmoid lower part is by the vomer and cartilage is this part hyaline cartilage and this is the roof of the mouth or heart palate this part and you see the anterior two-third by maxilla and posterior one-third by the palatine bone okay so that is the heart palate okay now we'll talk about the sinuses around the nasal cavity you have several a number of sinuses those are called paranasal sinuses and having sinuses we get some advantages number one those sinuses make the head part of the body light because of those cavities inside the bones of the face or skull <coughs> and number two since they are located around the nasal cavity or oral cavity and oral cavity uh, when we, we produce sound the quality of sound uh, is improved by the presence of those air filled cavities so enhance the resonance of voice and <clears throat> which bones uh, have the sinuses or air filled spaces or cavities frontal bone sphenoidal bone or sphenoid ethmoid and maxillary bones maxillary sinuses are the largest sinuses okay so maxillary sinuses are the largest here you see uh, these two are frontal sinuses and you remember i showed you in the lateral masses of ethmoid you have many ear cells and then in the sphenoid you have the sphenoidal sinuses and maxillary sinuses in the maxillary bones these are the bigger ones okay now we'll see uh, a hyoid bone hyoid bone uh, is not a bone of the skull not a bone of the vertebral column or so uh, it doesn't belong to the skull bones it doesn't belong to the vertebral column bones it, uh, it doesn't belong to the thoracic case so that's why it is called a lonely bone why it is called a lonely bone because it doesn't belong to any of those 
structures or groups another reason is this is the bone in your body which is not attached to another bone it is not directly attached to any bone it is actually uh, held in its position by the ligaments so it does not articulate with, with any bone <coughs> this hyoid bone uh, is very uh, useful bone it is the only bone in the front of the neck that supports the anterior neck muscles and anterior neck muscles uh, help in swallowing and also to move the tongue when you speak or you know do mastication so uh, those anterior neck muscles are supported by the hyoid bone very important okay <coughs> So if you see a hyoid bone, the location is here. So anterior neck muscles get attached to it and so get support by the hyoid bone. It has two greater horns and two lesser horns. So these are greater horns and these are lesser horns. And this is the body part. Okay. Vertebral column. <coughs> Vertebral column has different sets of bones in the neck part you have seven cervical vertebrae c1 to c7 okay c1 and c2 these two are different than all other vertebrae so we'll see how they look like they're different than other vertebrae okay then you have 12 thoracic vertebrae t1 to t12 12 thoracic vertebrae and then you have five lumbar five lumbar l1 to l5 okay and then one sacrum which is actually formed by the fusion of five sacral vertebrae in the early part of your life you had five sacral but later those five sacral vertebrae they join together to form one large triangular bone that is the sacrum and below the sacrum you have few coccyx the number is not fixed it varies because sometimes two coccygeal bones or coccyx fuse together to form one so usually we say uh, three to six the number may vary so those are the bones of the vertebral column the function of the vertebral column vertebral column helps to keep your body erected straight and also it protects the spinal cord because vertebral column inside the vertebral column you have the vertebral canal through which the spinal cord passes so protecting the spinal cord is also another important function and since it is you know helping you to keep your body erected and straight it also transmits the body weight from the upper part to the lower part of the body so from the upper portion of the body the weight is transmitted through the vertebral column so those are few important functions of the vertebral column now the vertebrae are attached to each other by the intervertebral discs so if you see uh, in between the vertebrae you have the intervertebral discs and intervertebral discs have two parts so this is the intervertebral disc this is body of the vertebrae above this is the body of the vertebrae below and in between inter means in between vertebral disc and in that disc if you see has an inner part which is soft jelly like structure called the nucleus pulposus 
and the outer part is hard like a ring and that's why it is called annulus. Annulus means ring. Nucleus is center, right? So inner part or center part is soft and that part is called the pulposus, nucleus pulposus and around that the outer part is like a ring and it is formed by the fibrocartilage fibrocartilage and that's why it is very strong tough and that is called annulus fibrosus a lot of fibers a lot of fibers and it is fibrocartilage tough so that is the intervertebral disc so here you can see this is the nucleus pulposus and this is the annulus fibrosus okay and they work uh, like cushion so when the body weight is transmitted uh, they work as cushion and um, however if a person uh, carries heavy weight a lot then gradually this intervertebral uh, get deteriorated and it may get thin and then the bones will come close to each other and then these two bones may get fused to each other okay fusion of the bones can occur prolapse of the vertebrae can happen another clinical condition that uh, also happens you see this is the normal location of the intervertebral disc you are looking the intervertebral disc from above so this side uh, the position is normal in this side and in this side you see uh, the part has moved backwards this is posterior this is anterior okay so that is called the slipped disc or herniated disc okay herniated disc Hernia means uh, movement of any structure from its normal position to abnormal position. So you see in this side it has moved backwards displacement and that is called herniated disc or slipped disc. The problem of slipped disc is that you see just behind the intervertebral disc this is the spinal nerve from both sides of the spinal cord spinal nerves get out so when slip disc occur that pushes the spinal nerve or presses the spinal nerve and that will cause numbness or pain in the area where this nerve is going to okay so that is a clinical condition <coughs> now we'll see the structure of a vertebrae a typical vertebrae if you see has seven processes what are those seven processes these two are called the transverse processes going laterally this one backwards that is the spinous process these two are called the superior articular processes and you are looking from the top that's why you don't see the inferior articular processes uh, so you have also inferior articular processes in the bottom so to transverse to superior to inferior right superior articular processes are like this going upwards and inferior articular processes are like this so this is the vertebrae okay so if i draw another vertebrae here these are the inferior articular processes and these are superior articular processes so what happens the superior articular processes of the vertebrae below articulate with the inferior articular processes of the vertebrae above they join okay so that's why you have facets facets are the kind of flat areas or surfaces where the attachment of the bones occur so those are seven processes then in the front you have a body of the vertebrae your intervertebral disc is located here and this is called the vertebral foramen 
through which the spinal cord passes okay so those are the parts of a typical vertebrae and i told you there are seven cervical vertebrae and c1 and c2 are different than others so let's see <coughs> this is one uh, typical cervical vertebrae not c1 or c2 how you know this is a cervical vertebrae if you see the spinous process the end of the spinous process is divided or is split or bifided so this is one feature of the cervical vertebrae another is in the transverse processes you have foramen called the transverse foramen for the vertebral artery vertebral artery takes blood to the brain so two vertebral arteries go to the brain towards the brain through the transverse foramen so if you see the divided spinous process and vertebral uh, transverse foramen in the transverse processes that is a cervical vertebrae okay usually the size of the body is much smaller than thoracic or lumbar but the size is a relative term right so you cannot depend on that you should depend on these two things <clears throat> then we'll see c1 and c2 they are different a typical c1 is also called atlas and c2 is also called axis this is a c1 c1 doesn't have any body so this is the only vertebrae that doesn't have a body so no body and two arches you see the posterior arch the bigger one and this is called the anterior arch here so posterior arch is bigger and anterior arch is smaller so no body to arches okay and since there is no body body is missing from here this vertebral for, uh, foramen is very big <coughs> axis or c2 axis is the only vertebrae that has an extended finger like structure that is sticks upwards from the body so this is the body and you see this is the finger like structure that goes upwards and that is called dense or odontoid process okay and this is only present in c2 or axis a uh, couple of clinical conditions abnormal bending of the spine or vertebral column it could be developmental or it can occur after birth so what are the common abnormal bending scoliosis kyphosis lordosis let's see <laughs> scoliosis is lateral bending so instead of like a, it is straight like this normally it should be straight right but in scoliosis we see sideway or lateral bending so here you can see scoliosis <coughs> kyphosis the upper part where you have the thoracic vertebrae you see here it is curved and more pushed backwards this is the normal location should go like this however in case of kyphosis you see it's more 
bent backwards and you can see from outside the, the persons the uh, back of the you know uh, upper part of the trunk is like you know curved you remember the <coughs> curtain uh, you probably have seen uh, hunchback of Notre Dame right so Quasimodo had kyphosis hunchback is kyphosis and lordosis occurs in the lower part of the vertebral column and instead of you know uh, going like this it is pushed more forward like if something pushes you from the back like this then this part will be more curved right here so that is the lordosis <coughs> spina bifida or spina bifida uh, is another clinical condition related to the vertebral column what happens the spine of the vertebrae this is the body of the vertebrae and you see uh, the spine when the spinous process is formed uh, if two halves when the vertebrae is formed the vertebrae is actually formed from two ossification centers so two halves are formed separately then they fuse together so this is one half of the spinous process this is another half of the spinous process okay eventually they fuse to form one spinous process <clears throat> and one body now if the fusion doesn't occur then what will happen we'll see that in between two halves of the spinous process there is a space and through which the covering of the spinal cord or the spinal cord with the covering can come out through the back spinous processes in the back right so if that happens that is spina bifida so this is the back of the vertebral column so you see here where the covering meninges this is the covering called the meninges as well as the spinal cord so both came out so this is called meningomyelocele if both the covering and the spinal cord itself come out this is more serious condition right so the, that can cause the damage of the spinal cord and can eventually cause paralysis however if the spinal cord is inside the vertebral canal only the covering comes out pops out that is called meningocele and this condition is less serious because the spinal cord is in right location so there's less chance or very little chance of getting damage of the spinal cord so that is meningocele so those are two different types of spina bifida so in uh, both cases you need the surgical procedure to fix them okay so those are the bones of the axial skeleton you need to know the last thing is the thoracic case let me just talk a little bit about thoracic cage thoracic cage uh, has 12 pairs of rib 12 pairs of ribs so that means 12 in each side okay and <coughs> You have one sternum which is the bone in the middle of the chest and also you have costal cartilages 
So these are the structures from the thoracic cage. <coughs> thoracic cage protects the lungs, heart, and large blood vessels in your body. Now, among the 12 pairs of ribs, upper seven pairs are called true ribs and lower five pairs are called false ribs. Upper seven, each upper seven uh, individually uh, articulates with the sternum and lower five uh, don't articulate uh, with the sternum individually. Among the lower false ribs, the upper three are called the non-floating non-floating and lower two are called the floating ribs okay <clears throat> why because if you see the lower two pairs their ends are free they are not attached to the sternum okay so the non-floating lower two pairs could be dangerous if something hits your uh, thoracic cage from you know uh, outside then since lower two the ends are like sharp and free and you have liver here under the lower, lower two uh, floating ribs if something hits the floating ribs then they can pierce through the liver okay so that could be dangerous so uh, anyway so thoracic, uh, the thoracic cage has 12 pairs of ribs one sternum and costal cartilages and among 12 pairs upper seven pairs are called the true ribs and lower five are called the false ribs among the lower five upper three are called non-floating because their ends are not floating they are attached to the sternum through the cartilage and the lowest two are floating their ends are free not attached to the sternum okay and <coughs> Those are the uh, ribs. Now, now, if you see the sternum, sternum has three parts. This is one part called the manubrium. This is the middle portion that is called the body of the sternum. And then you have the lowest part that is the gephoid process. So this is the sternum. located in the middle of the front of the chest and it has three pieces or three parts that is the manubrium the top part and this is the body of the sternum and this lowest part is called the jephoid process okay and the upper part of the manubrium has a notch called the jugular notch okay and the you know costal cartilages 
connect the ribs to the sternum okay so those are the bones of your axial skeleton so we have talked about the bones of the skull skull has two sets of bones eight cranial and 14 facial and then we have talked about the hyoid bone which is a lonely bone it doesn't belong to the skull or vertebral column or thoracic cage so it is a separate bone it supports the anterior neck muscles then we talked about the vertebrae the vertebral column the bones of the vertebral column seven cervical 12 thoracic five lumbar one sacrum and few coccyx and then we talked about the bones of the thoracic cage so those are the bones of the actual skeleton